Hi, I'm Pete Duncanson, Media Arts Pastor, and I'd like to take a moment to say thank you for being here. If you are physically here with us today, please be aware that for your safety, we are practicing social distancing and ask you to respect those that are using precautions as well. If you'd like to know more about what is going on right here at Central, whether upcoming events or just learning about who we are, check us out on the web, Facebook, and yes, we even have an app for that. If the ministry at Central has blessed you and you would like to give, you can do that multiple ways. By using the physical boxes located in the back by the sound booth, through online giving, or even through our app. Thanks again for joining us today, and God bless. Go in your Bibles this morning to the book of Matthew, chapter 26. Matthew chapter 26. Somebody, a few of the folks coming in told me it's, it had been raining out pretty hard. I don't know if it still is, but if you came in through the rain, God bless you and thank you. And our little buggy, hallelujah, that our little golf buggy has a lid on it. <clears throat> I might take up an offering to get doors and windows, and, and then we'll get a heater for it and air conditioning. <laughs> If Elon Musk would hurry up, the little cart will come and get you without even anybody being in. No, we don't want that, do we? Thank God. We, we love Brother John and whoever else helps come around and get everybody. Matthew chapter 26. We're going to read a little bit of scripture this morning, and then we're going to take communion together. Look with me as we begin in verse 17. On the first day of the festival of unleavened bread, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, Where do you want us to prepare the Passover meal for you? Passover began unleavened bread. The actual festival was longer than just that meal. It was multiple days. And it was one of the festivals where all the Jewish men had to come back to Jerusalem. So this was a big deal. And it was part of the calendar, the religious cultural calendar of Israel and of the people of God. And it was intended to bring the, the folks together for fellowship and for worship. Verse 18, as you go into the city, he told them, you will see a certain man. Tell him. The teacher says, my time has come, and I will eat the Passover meal with my disciples at your house. What a privilege to be the homeowner. So the disciples did as Jesus told them and prepared the Passover meal there. When it was evening, Jesus sat down at the table with the 12 disciples. While they were eating, he said, I tell you the truth, one of you will betray me. What a staggering statement in the midst of all that was going on. There was not one around that table who could have imagined that Jesus Christ would be betrayed, and especially by one of them. But even so, that time had come, and he knew of it. Greatly distressed, each one asked, in turn, am I the one, Lord? He replied, one of you who has just eaten from this bowl with me will betray me. For the Son of Man must die, as the Scriptures declared long ago. But how terrible it will be for the one who betrays him. It would be far better for that man if he had never been born. Judas, the one who would betray him, also asked, Rabbi, am I the one? Jesus told him, you have said it. As they were eating, Jesus took some bread and blessed it. Then he broke it in pieces and gave it to the disciples, saying, Take this and eat it, for this is my body. And he took a cup of wine and gave thanks to God for it. He gave it to them and said, Each of you drink from it. This is my blood, for this is my blood, which confirms the covenant between God and his people. It is poured out as a sacrifice to forgive the sins of many. Mark my words, I will not drink wine again until the day I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. Then they sang a hymn and went out to the Mount of Olives. Now I determined many years ago, I will not drink it again until I get to drink it with him. Yeah, thank you. That's a good place for an amen. Some of you have determined that as well. Listen, I, I don't care who you drink with in this life. It's never going to compare to drinking with him. And I'm using that term as the world uses it. Come on, let's go drink together. Isn't that what they say? And sometimes they'll say, let's go get drunk. But I'm telling you this morning, I'm looking forward to the, to the day that I drink my next drop. I've got it marked on my calendar. Well, it's not really on the calendar because I don't know exactly what day it's going to be. 
But there's a day coming when Jesus said, listen, I know how much you want to party. I know how much you want to celebrate. I know how much you just have inside of you, built inside this desire because you're a creature unlike any other. The elephants can't do it and not the hippopotamuses. He can smile from ear to ear. And he can sure chase you too. But he cannot party like I designed and created you to party. And there's a day coming when I'll be here to party with you. Now as a, as a memorial to that, as a commitment to that, I've decided not to party until then. Pastor Lance, you as well, right? Hallelujah. But I'm looking forward to it. Well, anyways, let's talk about communion today. What is communion? Communion was established by Jesus Christ. It wasn't established by the Jewish priesthood. It wasn't established by the government. It was established by the Lord Jesus Christ, and he made a profound, actually provocative statement as he introduces it. This is the new covenant. Now, they would have known that there was a new covenant promise because of the Old Testament, the scriptures that Jesus was always referring to. There is a new covenant. And the promise was, I will give you this because the old one really isn't good enough. It came from heaven, but it's not quite good enough. And there's going to be a new one someday. God promised it, especially, I think it's in Ezekiel. But you'll see uh, shadows of it, even in the writings of Moses. You'll see shadows of it in Isaiah. And here comes this new covenant. And in this upper room, celebrating Passover, beginning the feast of, of, of what we've read about here, the feast of, what was it called? It just jumped out of my mind. Unleavened bread. I just had... Uh, tabernacles in my mind. I knew that wasn't right. T to begin that, Jesus says to them, now come together with me and let's prepare. And this isn't just Passover tonight. This is something so much more than Passover. As a matter of fact, what you've just participated in, what you've just eaten was the last Passover. And what I'm about to give you is the first communion. This is new. This is different. You won't understand it right now. If I tell you all about it, you might want to kill me. As Jewish as you are, as radical about Judaism as you are, born into it, steeped in it for generations, you may not yet understand, but very soon you will. I'm about to be betrayed. After I'm betrayed, I'll be crucified. You'll, you'll be in grief beyond explanation. But on the third day, you'll understand what communion's all about. So I'm going to go on that journey today with you, and I, I'm going to invite you into this journey with me because communion is profound. Communion is transformative. But if we don't understand it, if we just look at it as some bread and some juice, we miss the spiritual significance and, and the historical connotation, what was changing that still impacts the world today. And out of Communion comes so much. Now, Paul writes a lot about it. The Holy Spirit anointed him to give us much teaching. But experientially, we find it in the Gospels. Luke tells us that Judas was there all through the communion. And that somewhere just after that, in some moments, he goes out as John captures Jesus saying to him, what you're going to do, go do. There's no stopping you now, go. You've already committed to being there, don't stay here. You want to be with them and not me, go, get out. You and I have the privilege of looking back on that. We don't know what it was like that night, the intensity of that moment. But what we do know is that Jesus then walked out, lived out, demonstrated what happens as a result of communion. Look at verse 36 now. Matthew chapter 26, verse 36. Then Jesus went with them to the olive grove. Olive grove. Before I read this, let me ask you something. If you knew you were going to die in less than 24 hours, how much time would you spend in prayer? If you knew that you were going to die, that it was going to be a very destructive death, 
and it was going to be in less than 24 hours. Heaven had opened up, dropped down a prophetic word to you, and you were made to know that you had but hours to live. How much time would you spend in prayer? Wouldn't you think, well, I listen, God knows I've prayed, but that's just a waste of time now. I, I just don't feel it emotionally. My, my stomach's sick. I can't even breathe. I don't know what to do. How can I pray? Pastor, you can't even ask me a question like that. I don't have time. to. Th- I've got people to call. I've got to make sure my will is actually written up. I've got to tell you how I want my service to be. Pastor, you need to know all this. I, don't, I, I can't even think of it, so I just don't. I just ignore all that. If you knew. How much time would you spend in prayer? All right, back to 36. Then Jesus went with them to Gethsemane and said, Sit here while I go over there to pray. What? You're going to go over there and pray? He took Peter and Zebedee's two sons, James and John, and he became anguished and distressed. Well, of course you're going to become anguished and distressed. You know you're going to die. He told them, My soul is crushed with grief to the point of death. Stay here. And keep watch with me. He went on a little farther, bowed his face to the ground, praying, My Father, if it's possible, let this cup of suffering be taken away from me. Yet I want your will to be done, not mine. Then he returned to the disciples and found them asleep. He said to Peter, Couldn't you watch with me even one hour? You were praying for an hour? You're going to die? And you've spent a whole hour in prayer? Keep watch and pray so that you will not give in to temptation, for the spirit is willing, but the body is weak. Then Jesus left them a second time and prayed, My Father, If this cup cannot be taken away unless I drink it, your will be done. When he returned to them again, he found them sleeping, for they couldn't keep their eyes open. Now, this is interesting. He's the one that's going to die, and he's getting deeper and deeper into prayer. Not only are they not going to die, they're not even going to be afflicted, hurt, in any form or fashion physically. And yet they're getting more and more tired. Funny things happen in prayer. Verse 44. So he went to pray a third time, saying the same things again. Then he came to the disciples and said, go ahead and sleep, have your rest. So number one this morning, communion paves the way for prayer. Communion. Prayer is not something you have to do. Prayer is not something that's religious as a duty. Prayer is not something that older people do, but you're not quite old enough to really do it yet. Prayer is not something that you do when you're in trouble, when the car's sliding sideways on the ice. Prayer is not something you do when your kids are out past midnight or one or three or for days on end. Prayer is not something you do when you pass somebody on the street and they're homeless and you say, boy, I hope God touches them. Prayer is our privilege It is the greatest experience that we as God's people can have. It is spending intimate time with him, locking ourselves into his presence and communion. Jesus says in that upper room when they are not only celebrating Passover, that's the meal, but he slides all that out of the way and he brings the bread and the juice and he says, listen to me, I'm going to show you what happens when you have communion. Communion gets you ready for prayer, and prayer gets you ready for communion. I wanted to do communion today at the end of the service because I wanted you to be able to prepare for it, to to think through what it is, what Jesus Christ has offered, what he did to make that offer literal, not just symbolic, not just religious, but to make that offer life-giving. You think about all that's going in to what's taking place, all the, the ingredients, what he's going through. Yes, but he was the son of God, but he lived as the son of man, and yet he did all of this for us. With less than 24 hours to live, he spent three of them in prayer. I don't know if I'd do that. Matter of fact, I'm pretty confident I would not do that. But I know I should. Years ago, I I heard many times that when Billy Graham was asked, if you only had three or four years um, to get ready, what was it, to to be in ministry. You weren't going to be in ministry three or four years. He said, I would spend, and I forget, I think if you only had four years to be in ministry, he said, I would spend three in preparation. I forget the exact numbers, but the point was, it's so important to get ready. He's getting ready. He's getting ready. 
And when you go into prayer, you're getting ready. Every time you kneel down before the Lord or bow your head, or if you're at the sink doing dishes or putting them in the dishwasher, Sister Pam does the dishes and then puts them in the dishwasher. I don't understand that. Mine, they go in if they got pizza on them or spaghetti or what, they just go in. That's what the dishwasher's for. I grew up with the Flintstones, and you just held it over there and let the dog lick it. And it was clean. Right? Put it away. It's disinfected because whatever that dog can lick, he's cleaned it. It's done. When, when, when we go into communion, we're preparing, we're getting ready, and, 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 and it, it tells us that we have access to God, and it, it allows us to pray. It reminds us of the privilege that we have an audience with the king, that he invites us in. He doesn't demand it. He doesn't force us. As a matter of fact, that's one of the greatest signs that the Lord Jesus Christ is who he says he is because he'll stand right there. He'll wait. He'll invite. He'll welcome, but he will not make you pray. Circumstances might make you pray. Hallelujah. For emotions of dealing with your circumstances might make you pray. But I'm going to tell you that when you come into the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ, you're coming in with faith. You're coming in not to a religious house, a religious experience, not out in the desert with a teepee, but you're coming in to the holy presence of the King of glory, the creator of all, and he's going to listen. Even though there are billions of people, he's going to listen to you and he's Hear your hearts cry. Praise God. Pastor, I, I just don't know if I can believe that. <laughs> Do you know that they take a picture of the entire inter internet every second? There's a snapshot of the entire internet every second. <laughs> so that every time somebody says, well, blah, 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 I, I don't think so-and-so said it. They just go back. And they find out what was said in Twitter five years ago because it was, ca it was captured. Not just one conversation, all of them. Now, if we, little old us, in our noodle brains, can do that. See, we're created in God's image. That's why some of these nutcases want to play God and call it technology. They want to they want to be God over you and I and call it the advancement of mankind. <laughs> Facebook and Twitter and whatnot. All right, I'm losing you. Come on, let's go to this next thing. Go to chapter 26. Prayer, 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 prayer. Prayer must contain thanksgiving for communion an appreciation of what he has done for us. Prayer should contain thanksgiving for communion. He gave us this. You don't have to get on an airplane, fly to Saudi Arabia and walk a thousand times around a rock out there in the middle. You don't have to go to Israel and say this is the place he was born. Here's where he died. This is where he ascended. Thank God for all those places. It's cool to see him. But you don't have to do that. But you need to take communion. You've got to have time with the Lord Jesus Christ. And even in the face of death, having been betrayed, knowing that he was about to endure all of the suffering and then the cross, he spent three hours in prayer because he had just had communion. Communion will make you want to pray. All right, now look at verse 20, uh, 57. Matthew chapter 26, verse 57. Then the people who had arrested Jesus led him to the home of Caiaphas, the high priest, where the teachers of religious law and the elders had gathered. Meanwhile, Peter followed. He followed him at a distance and came to the high priest's courtyard. He went in and sat with the guards and waited to see how it would all end. Now look at chapter 27, verse 11. Matthew 27, verse 11. Now Jesus was standing before Pilate, the Roman governor. Are you the king of the Jews? The governor asked him. Jesus replied, you have said it. When the leading priests and the elders made their accusations against him, Jesus remained silent. Don't you hear all these charges they're bringing against you, Pilate demanded. But Jesus made no response to any of the charges, much to the governor's surprise. So I showed you a snippet of his trial before the high priest and the religious people. Then we begin to look at his trial before 
the uh, governor or proconsul, whatever you want to think of them as, and the secular people, Romans and Jews. I didn't show you his kind of trial before Herod. You can see that in Luke. But I just wanted to bring this to you. Number two this morning, communion tempers us for trials. Communion paves the way for prayer. That's what's going to flow out of you from communion. When you recognize that Jesus gave, surrendered his body, not just for our sins, but as the sacrifice for our sins, that Jesus Christ knew exactly who he was and what he was doing, that he had left the glory of heaven. Now, you and I haven't seen it. We can't even imagine it. But not only did he leave that wonderful, perfect location, but he came to this horrible, broken place. I don't think there are any bathrooms or outhouses in heaven. But this place is full of them. Yeah. I'm, gonna, I'm not going to go further there. I could say a lot more. <laughs> and sometimes you can't find one when you really need one. But he hadn't, he hadn't had to experience any of that. And yet he chose, willingly embraced that plan. So when you and I begin to think about who he is, what he did so that we could live, then we, we begin to understand communion, what communion symbolizes, what it evidences, what it brings to you and I, the force behind it, and it paves the way for prayer. But it also tempers you and I for trials because Jesus Christ wasn't just betrayed. He was now brought to trial, and the first trial was somewhat, I guess you would say, religious. It was all about Judaism. Who are you to say that you could tear down the temple or that the temple would be torn down and then you would build it, rebuild it in three days? Who are you to say that all of these things that we celebrate are no good? Jesus never, never disrespected God's word or the law of Moses. He did, however, constantly poke at their superstitions, the things they had added to the law, all of those humanistic accompaniments they had given to his worship. And so they criticize him and accuse him and then condemn him. Then they take him to the secular trial, and he stands trial there, never answering a word, never saying anything. And again, if you look in, I think it's Luke, maybe John, but Luke certainly gives us the snapshot. Just a few moments, he's at Herod's place as well. And, and there he is uh, the same kind of deal. Herod wanted to see some miracles. Jesus doesn't say anything, and he sends him back to uh, Pilate. Trials. If you don't have a smart watch on, you might want to just put your fingers on your wrist like that and check your pulse. Or you can just hold your hand up and see if you're breathing. And if you are, if you have a pulse and you're breathing, you're going to go through trials. You are. And most of us know that because we've already been through them. And I'm not talking about uh, trials where you are arrested and taken to court. That, that could certainly be. But I'm talking about the trials of life. I'm talking about the difficulties that we have going through all of that. And when you and I have the Lord Jesus Christ, we begin to understand that trials come. And when, when we have communion, we're tempered for them. If we don't, you're going to lose your temper in them. When you have him, you're tempered for them. Without him, you'll lose your temper in them. There are people, millions across this planet, who are spending every ounce of their energy, much of their treasure, to try and avoid trials, and yet it's life. Trials are going to come. Listen, you didn't build the Garden of Eden. You can't bring it back. You didn't build paradise. You can't create one. I don't care how many millions or billions of dollars you have. You can build the biggest and the best house, and you step back and say, that looks good, and you'll see it start falling apart right while you're looking. If you don't mow the grass, it'll come up and bring forth weeds, and all your shrubs will just go wild, and then other things will take over your shrubs. If you don't take care of your tomato plants and your pepper plants and whatnot, they're, they're, you're just going to come back and there's not going to be anything there. It takes constant effort to make it decent. You haven't even come close to making it paradise. The smart guys think we're going to go to Mars and create paradise there. <laughs> the 
trials of life will come. Will they destroy us? Now, interestingly enough, in the context that I'm using it, trials only shows up two places in the New Testament outside of what we're talking about with Jesus. The, tr- the, the idea of trials, in the context I'm using it, two places in the New Testament, once by Paul, that we face trials. Six times in five references by Peter. who stood there at the trial, having just said, I'll I'll die with you, and now denying him. And you talk about guilt for the rest of his life. Why didn't I? How could I? In the moment of trial, I was unprepared. In the moment of trial, I failed. In the moment of trial, I lost my temper. I swore and cussed that I didn't know him. In the moment of trial, he, he, I was stripped naked by the circumstances of life and I had nothing to stand on except that Jesus Christ had said that Satan was coming to try me and sift me and that he had prayed for me that my faith wouldn't fail. But I, 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 I failed failed him. My faith did fail. And time after time in 1 Peter and 2 Peter, it's him who comes in as our older brother and says, you will withstand every trial. It will make you stronger in your faith. You will not be destroyed by your trials. Don't give up, child of God, but hang on to the promises in your trial because I've been there. I know what it's like to stand shoulder to shoulder with him in a trial and mess up. But then he looked at me, and he'd given me that promise that even though you deny me, I'll still love you. 1 Peter 1 6, 1 7, 4 12, 4 13, 2 Peter 2 9, six times in five references, Peter speaks to you and I about the trials of life and what Jesus Christ is doing for us. It wasn't Paul, it wasn't James, it wasn't Jude. It wasn't John, who was the disciple he loved, was there all through it, through every, just there, and wasn't him. But Peter, who understands the word like you and I understand it, who understands it inside out, outside in, who understands it at its broken down level, at the very deepest, darkest moment of the trial, he understands what it is to have the Lord look at him and say, you're failing in trial. And I personally, I believe it's because they did not think of communion as much more than kind of a little dessert to Passover. See, if you do this this morning, if you take communion and you don't understand what it is you're doing, you're not going to be prepared for the trials you're going to face later today, tomorrow, the rest of the week. I've been with people in ministry, working with believers for 35 years. You, I can't count the times people have said to me, I'm so glad the Lord had me ready. All of us would like to say, I I wish the Lord would have never led me through this. I wish this never would have happened. But I, I countless times people have said to me, I'm so glad the Lord had me ready. And I want to say to you today, this morning, communion gets you ready. Communion helps you, strengthens you, speaks into you. Communion reminds you of the promises of God that he will not fail. And the promises of Jesus Christ that I go to prepare a place for you. Amen. Here's the third and final thing this morning. Look at at chapter 27, verse 50. I love this text. Matthew 27, 50, then Jesus shouted out again, and he released his spirit. You know what we didn't do, Pamela? We were going to do prayer in in the worship time. We'll fix it. What we're going to move to here eventually is, as we enter into worship, allowing you to come for prayer and have the prayer teams here then for uh, prayer for you. Pastor, why are you saying that now? Because it just popped into my head right now, and if I don't deal with it now, I'll forget. That's because you're getting old. No, it's not. It's because I'm busy. got stuff in my brain. <laughs> Then Jesus shouted out again, and he released his spirit. 
At that moment, the curtain in the sanctuary of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook, rocks split, tombs opened. Praise God. I want to read that again. At that moment, the curtain in the sanctuary, that thing was one fabric, inches thick, inches. Some say three inches thick, some say more. In other words, not just heavy, not canvas, but thick, not layers, but woven that way. I don't even know how they could make it, but it was a wonder of the world. I don't mean one of the authentic, I just mean that everybody who who had the privilege of witnessing it, and very few did, would say this is an unbelievable fabric, one of a kind. It separated God's presence from his people. At that moment, the curtain in the sanctuary of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook, rocks split, tombs opened. The bodies of many godly men and women who had died were raised from the dead, but they didn't leave the cemetery, verse 53 says, until later. But I want to tell you this about communion. Number three this morning, communion releases us for resurrection. communion. There's no other way in. Jesus Christ said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. You're not going in by any other religion. You're not getting in by any superstition. You're not going to rub magic rocks, and you're not going to chant to the universe and the energy that's positive today and negative tomorrow. None of that's getting you in. He's the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father but by him. You can walk around your rock until your feet fall off. You can hold on to this statue or these beads, but it's Jesus Christ and him alone. There is no other way given among men, no other name whereby we might be saved. Communion says, I'm getting ready for resurrection. Hallelujah. It's a commitment that the partaker will accept the cross and its requirements. Communion is a commitment that the partaker will accept the cross and its requirements and in exchange will receive the promise of power over all things in this life and the life to come. If you've ever felt the presence of God, if you've ever seen something godly in a dream, in a vision, if you've ever known God's touch when you were reading his word, singing a song, then everything in this word is true. Everything, every promise will be kept. Every bit of it will come to pass. And the biggest part, the most blessed part, this life is not it, gang. As much as we like it and try to hold on to it, as much as we say, wow, this is pretty and that's pretty. I've got these sunglasses. I I showed them to Sister Pam yesterday. I don't know what they do, but the greens, there are shades of green I've never seen before like whoa what is that I read a few months ago where they discovered another shade of blue I don't even know what that means what do you mean you discovered it what what does how do you discover something that you didn't even know existed and you just made it up don't you just mix paint together like when we were in third grade there it is none of that none of that even begins to tell the story or describe the goodness of God's kingdom where you and I are intended to spend forever, that you and I get to experience that and never leave it, not have it, uh, not one drop of sin, not one disobedience, not one act of disobedience, not one rebellion. People, last Sunday and then Wednesday night, just losing their mind. I lost you last Sunday when I said, listen, there's not... In the kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ, let's talk for a minute about his government here on earth, a thousand years millennium. And we have it in our mind that it's just going to be, well, well, whatever. People are just going to do whatever. People are not going to do whatever. They're going to live as slaves. Unbelievers. Those few who make it through the tribulation. And the Garden of Eden shows us we only need one man, one woman. That's all we need. So if you think two billion are coming through the tribulation, I'm not sure they are. I'm not sure 200 million are going to make it through, but that's between you and God. 
But whoever makes it through, gang, I'm telling you what, they're not glorified in their body. You and I who love the Lord Jesus Christ, you and I who are a part of the resurrection, you and I who have done everything, lived as slaves now, died to this world, given up everything to follow him. You and I who have paid the price, given sacrifice and and given sacrificially, who have loved Jesus through it all, declared his name in spite of trials and tribulations. You and I, friends, are ruling and reigning with him. Who do you think we're going to rule and reign over? And any mistake they make is judged immediately. Anything worthy of death, they're executed now, not later. Not after 17 years of trial and, and uh, uh, what do you say when you want to uh, say that you, you weren't, you're wrongfully, you uh, take it to trial again? Repeal. Now, is that what you said? That's not the right word. Appeal. Good grief. See, don't try this. You're not pros. You gotta, if you're, preaching's hard. And people don't understand. This is his kingdom. Nothing will offend in all of his holy mountain. Not one, dis- not any act of disobedience. What he says is law. If you fight against it, you rebel against it, ah, dead. So don't coddle anybody and tell them, hey, as long as you make it through the tribulation, everything will be fine. It will not be fine. They'll hate every minute of living through that thousand years, knowing what they could have had, but having to live in slavery for a thousand years. And if they run their mouth sideways, they're dead instantly. Any of them are going to hate it so bad that when Satan himself shows up at the end, he deceives all of them. I don't even think it's going to take much deception. He says, just come on, we'll, we'll take it this time. Jesus Christ came to give us resurrection power. Amen. Communion releases us for resurrection. Don't wait. Don't make this a, an appointment for some other time. You make it an appointment for now. Don't you say, I'll do it some other time. You do it now. Communion is the confidence that we have that Jesus Christ has made us promises. Well, Pastor, what about people who have already passed away and they didn't know the Lord? You and I don't know anybody's heart. You don't know my heart. I don't know yours. All we can do is work out our own salvation with fear and trembling. He's a gracious God. He loves people. He's not willing that any should perish. Communion says, I am released and ready for resurrection. Amen? That's what we're ready for. Praise God. I want us to get ready for communion this morning. And I want to tell you that this is a miracle that you hold in your hands. It's not just a symbol of the miracle. We do not believe, as some do, that this bread becomes the body of Jesus Christ. We don't need it to be the body. The body was needed for the sacrifice. What we need this to be is the promise. I don't need this to be his blood. His blood was put on the mercy seat, sprinkled over all the things in in heaven, Priscilla tells us in Hebrews. See, I slid that right in there. He sprinkled it. His blood was needed there. What I need is the promise of the work of his blood. That's the miracle you hold. You hold the miracle of his promise to you and I. You hold the miracle of his promise that he will go with you through every trial, that he will hold you in every fire, that he will help you in every time of disappointment, disillusionment, confusion, and stress, that he will help you in times of anxiety. He will hold your hand and bring you through. And on the right day, you'll meet him. You got your emblems? Are there any of you who do not have bread? Guys, who has um, Brother Rick's coming? Um, He's going to come this way first, and Brother Aaron's coming as well. Anybody that needs bread? Oh, okay, here we got guys. Thank you so much. You hold your hand up until they get to you. Now, you might be sitting there saying, Pastor, you didn't even get an altar call because we always give an altar call here. There's not a person in this building that doesn't know how to get saved. And all you need to do is do business with you and Jesus and get it dealt with. Make the decision that you're not going back. 
Communion is a commitment to the cross. It's not a commitment to wanting to go to heaven. Everybody wants that. Judas wanted that. But communion is a commitment to watch Jesus go to the cross and live likewise. That's the challenge. He did it without our help. We can't do it without his help. I'm so glad that he had disciples like Peter that just turned his back in the trial and said, I don't, I don't know how I can, I can be a part of this. this. This isn't the way I wanted to go. Life isn't going the way I wanted to go. But then Peter wrote to you and I and said, listen, in the trials you go through, you'll find Jesus because the trying of your faith is more precious than gold. You heard Sister Pam talk about her best friend. They, they grew up teaching each other the piano, learning songs together on the telephone from house to house. Her friend's dad was the evangelist that they sang with night after night after night across the state of Ohio. And she told me about the three of them, her older sister and her friend Connie and herself in the back of that car rolling around trying to sleep. And probably they couldn't sleep because he'd give them a Pepsi every night after the revival. Glory to God. <clears throat> Leaving out of those places, because those were the days when you prayed for everybody that was there and you prayed for half an hour for each one so you didn't leave till 10, 11 o'clock at night or later. And then driving all the way home, one, two, three, four hours, getting in the house and getting up and going to school. That young lady ended up really struggling for a lot of years, in and out of addiction. She was the exact same age as Sister Pam. And and um, we're troubled about where she was spiritually, but we're trusting. And then Sister Terry Dudiak, Sister Kelly, Sister Kelly Wasdor, Brother Rick Ware's sister, passed away yesterday. And then this morning, my sister called me. Everything you've seen us do this morning, her and I, has been by faith. Because this morning, before my mom woke up, my dad slipped into eternity. We we're so fortunate because we've known about this day for a while. When I was in Pakistan in March, he almost passed away and they did surgery, pretty complicated, and did a lot of things. I was up there last Sunday night, Monday, just this past week. I knew he wasn't good, didn't know when, but knew he wasn't good. For those of you who don't know, 10 and a half years ago, almost 11 years ago, this coming September, Labor Day, my dad fell off a roof and broke his neck and became a quadriplegic. For 10 and a half years, my mom took care of him in a form and fashion that I can't even describe to you. His sister, my aunt, stepped in seven years ago, which allowed Sister Pam and I to start thinking about pastoring again five years ago, and that's how we were able to come here. My dad was um, different. <laughs> and I texted my kids this morning, said, I'm so glad there's room in heaven for guys like him. As we take communion this morning, I want to remind you there's room in heaven for gals like you and guys like you. That's what heaven's all about. I, I can't be perfect. I wasn't raised by a perfect father. <laughs> you just have no idea. <laughs> Growing up as a kid in the early 70s and what we were like, I, I just, there are stories that I will take to my grave, I'm sure. <clears throat> he was insane. <clears throat> they worked hard and they partied hard too, and it was um, sometimes a nightmare. But heaven isn't made for people who have perfect parents because there aren't any. Heaven's made for a perfect Savior who invites his sons and daughters to walk in his perfection and to come in. I don't know who you've lost recently, who you're still grieving, maybe a year or five after the passing, but Jesus is enough. Pastor Adam, would you come this morning and help us with communion? And uh, Casey, it looks like, is coming as well. Let's prepare to receive the bread this morning. I'm not going to read any more from the scriptures because I read to you the whole text of it. As Casey gets ready to pray over the bread, if you've never received Jesus Christ, you need to do that right now. You need to say, that's it. I'm not going back out there. But pastor, it'll be hard. Yep, I don't care if you start when you're 16 or 60. Those first few months are brutal. It's just the way it is. 
And if you think you're going to somehow wait until it gets smooth, that day will never come. You've got to say, Jesus, take me through this battleground. I've made up my mind to live for you. Casey, go ahead and pray for our bread this morning. Jesus, we thank you so much today. You're so good to us. God, you're so good. You're better than any God in the world. You're better than any man. You're a good God. And you're a God who keeps your word. And your word says that you gave your son to die for us and that his body was broken for us, his body. And we thank you, Jesus, so much for giving up your body for us, that one day we might be with the Father in heaven. We thank you that even in these dark times where the world is getting even darker day by day, we have the eternal promise of eternal salvation. And our loved ones that are taken from us are brought in loving arms to Jesus Christ. Jesus, thank you so much for your body that was broken like a piece of bread. Thank you, thank you, thank you for the price you paid. Amen. Amen. Come on, let's take the bread together today. such wonderful bread. We appreciate these portable things, Lord, but they can sometimes distract us from the reality of communion. We appreciate that the day is coming when we're going to have the best bread and the best wine ever. Now you have to um, fight to get your cup open. You can do that now or after. But Pastor Adam, go ahead and pray for the cup for us today, please. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the plan of salvation that you do have, that none should perish, but that all should come in understanding and relationship with you. Father, we thank you that your blood washes us white as snow. Heavenly Father, we stand before you this morning humbly, searching our hearts, Lord Jesus, forgive us. Forgive us of our shortcomings, Lord Jesus. Forgive us, Lord God. Help us to be of a humble and contrite people falling before you and worshiping and honoring you and glorifying you as King of kings and Lord of lords. Father, our hope and our confidence is in Jesus and Jesus Christ alone. And because your spirit lives in us, your spirit lives in us and gives us the strength and the ability to continue to press forward, to press forward in this life and Father, to let your light shine in us and through and into other people's life, giving you the glory and the honor. Father, we thank you this morning. We praise you this morning for sending your son, Jesus, for the freedom and the liberty and the power that we have to press forward and to glorify you in Jesus' name. Come on, let's receive the juice together this morning. Many of you came in here today needing everything that I needed. And I didn't want to rob you of what you needed. There's time for us as a family. Thank you, those of you who have gathered around, Brother Rick and the family. These things are not easy. Thank you, my brothers on the board and, and leaders here in the church and pastors, just to feel that support and encouragement. I don't believe there will be a service for my dad this week. And uh, he had asked for just graveside. Uh, we may or may not honor that, but... Uh, <laughs> We, uh, my, my little sister in Michigan has a lot of very significant family obligations this week. She's dropping her daughter off at the Army National Guard right now while I'm talking to you. Her oldest daughter just went into the Guard. Her other daughter graduates Thursday or Friday night from high school. So, But thank you for loving us. Um, we'll be out of the loop a little bit over the next week or so, but we love you very much. We're so very heartbroken 
for Brother Rick and Sister Kelly's whole family, for Sister Terry and Brother John. They attended here for many years, and their kids, I know, were devastated. It's, um, it's just challenging, you know? But we have this hope. We have this hope. Amen. You want to say anything? Pray for us. Yeah, we're going to take off this afternoon. And I, I called my mom this morning. Their pastor, I didn't even pray with them because I'm the son, not the pastor. Their pastor had already called and prayed with her. When I walked into the hospital one night, a night or two after my dad had fallen, I counted. I lost track how many pastors came in. As I grew up, my dad was well-known everywhere in wrestling. So everywhere I went, all, all, everybody I knew was because of him. I, he was this huge extrovert, and I was this shy introvert. But the longer I was in ministry, the more of my friends became his friends. And um, when his dad passed away, who didn't even go to church, my grandfather, there were five pastors at the funeral. And that night in the hospital, I thought of Pastor Frank, who was an evangelist, who had had such an influence on my family. He stayed at Pittsburgh for hours on end. Their pastor, Nathan, our friend, Pastor Mead, uh, pastor uh, from down at West Alexander. I went in one night and I heard somebody praying. I looked around the room, I can't see anything. My dad's in a, in a special bed. And I look around and he's laying on the floor of the ICU, praying for my dad, laying on the floor. Spirit-filled Presbyterian. And um, what a blessing. But my dad loved the churches that we pastored. He would always ask about you guys. And um, for several years, they drove down and attended church here. And uh, went to Sunday school with the Dudiacs and Wares and Wasdorps and he just always asks, how's the church doing? How's, it just last month, Sunday, Sunday night, how's the church doing? And I'm just so grateful that you guys love not only us, but my family and Pam's family. May the Lord bless you today and give you strength and keep you in your trial. May the Lord remind you that he's with you. Sometimes he'll let you feel that, but even when you don't, he's there. May God hold you in the fire so that when they look inside, they see a fourth man walking where no one should be walking. May he give you miracles, cause you to rise up, stand strong because of communion. May you declare the blood of Jesus Christ because you've partaken of the bread of his body. May you walk in the confidence of his promises and be a victor over all the attacks of Satan, all the oppression. May you and I give him a, a, a shot in the nose every once in a while, like this morning. May we say, Satan, we respect you. We regard you, but we are not bowing to you. We don't serve you. And our king is coming back for us soon, and we're going to live for him until he does. May Jesus Christ cause you to be prospered. I pray for your finances. I pray that you would become blessed financially. I pray for your body, that you would be blessed physically. I pray for your business, if you own one, your job, if you have one, your education, if you're getting one. I pray that God would prosper you in all things, that he would give you great friends in the kingdom of God. I was texting friends in Pakistan this morning texting friends in other parts of the world because they knew my dad. So Pastor Salvador told me the other day, he called and said, how's your dad doing? I said, well, not real good. He said, well, you tell me because I want to come to the service. May God give you friends in the kingdom. I bless you to know the Lord and to make him known throughout this week. In the mighty name of Jesus, amen, amen. Sister Pam and I love you very much. Have a beautiful, beautiful, unmasked week. Hallelujah. Draw me.